first to enter the den is inventor Noel Marshall from County Clare, who isn't short on confidence <laughs> when it comes to his concept. Our product's inevitably going to go global. We're going to have major players come in and buy us out for 50, 60, 100 million. Our product range is that good. And the business he's bringing in today comes with a big hitting advocate. We're Let's on. Let's do it. We're on. Let's go. Ah! <laughs> I have an Olympic bronze medalist here with me. Come on. Marilyn Okoro. Marilyn attributes her product to her shooting for Tokyo 21 now. It's helped her so much. I've got a similar product like this at home. It is cheap, but like 10 quid. Maybe that's why your bad back is still bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will Noel's company be in better shape than Tuka's back? Hey Dragons, uh, my name is Noel Marshall. I'm here today to make you a pitch for my business. 10% equity stake in, sorry. Uh, oh. You good, just breathe. Hi Dragons, uh, my name is Noel Marshall. I'm here today to p make you a pitch for a 5% equity stake in my business in exchange of a £100,000 investment. I'm here with Marilyn Okoru, Olympic medalist. She's going to be shooting for her third Olympics in 21. Massive advocate of our products, has been using it extensively. The backballer came about five years ago after battling many years, chronic lower back pain, a uh, consultant surgeon said, you were going to require back surgery. Now, at the time, I was only 39 years of age. I wasn't going to take it lying down. So I put a foam roller in half, mounted it in a timber frame. I started using that for two hours a day. A month later, I was pain free. I showed what I had to top level physios, chiros. Everyone said, you have to commercialize this. Uh, that's my pitch. Um, if you have any questions for Marilyn, it would be awesome. Yeah, Marilyn, I've got a question. Do you own a share in the company? I do not, no. And are you paid for the company to endorse the product? No, I'm not. Essentially, I was going to retire. I was fed up with um, the multiple sort of injuries I was having, and he sort of said, try this. And that was the reason why, two years ago, I decided to continue for Tokyo. That's a great endorsement for the product. Thanks. And we wish you every best of luck and go and yeah, get out luck. of the park. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, she's going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll chat after. Hopefully I'll have good news. <laughs> a device to relax the muscles that cause lower back pain is the product inventor Noel Marshall hopes will get the backing of the dragons. I'd love to invite you to come up and have a go. Have I any takers? How are you? Okay, just let the lady with the skirt go and give it a go. Well done, Sarah. Noel's asking for a £100,000 investment. You could have saved me this unladylike <laughs> whole thing, you two. <laughs> in return, he's willing to hand over a 5% stake in his company. That is a lot easier than what I do at home. If you want to get in with a little bit more aggression, well, sir. You're all good. Just wanted to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah Meaden is first to roll out the questions. So, Noel, how long has this been on the market? We're going into our fifth year, Deborah. Yeah. OK. And what's the profile of those sales been? Is it growing? Is it static? Yeah, the first year we'd done £450,000 in sales. So four hundred and fifty year one, year two? Yeah. Then it came back a bit in year two. We'd done two hundred and fifty. Yeah. Year three, uh, three hundred and fifty. Yeah. And last year we'd done almost 700000 So what do you put that upturn to? Uh, we actually got quite a benefit off the back of COVID. I think a lot of people just had more time to really focus on their health and fitness. No. Yeah. I uh, just want to understand the main difference between yours and the competitors. So your one has got rollers on a stable platform and you're the only one that does that or other competitors also have that system? No, that's unique to us. And so do you have any IP on it, or patent or protection yeah, on no, it? Yeah, it, no, it, it's, it's very well protected. Each product has design registration, patent design. What do you mean, patent design? That's not a thing. 
either you've patented it... Design rights, design registration. Design registration. Yeah. It's very different to a patent. in America on the big frame body. So model. you don't have a patent on this product? No, just the design. Just the design registered. Yeah. Having come to the invention mill for 20 odd years, I felt like a busy fool just paying for patent fees. I understand and appreciate that as someone who spends hundreds of thousands a year on upkeep yeah. patents. Yeah. Um, I do feel like you were pulling the wool a little bit over our eyes, though, talking the way you talked about patents to start with. It's much easier for a competitor to work around a design registration than it is around a patent. Perhaps. Sarah Davies discovers that Noel's invention isn't quite as protected as it first appeared. Deborah Meaden now wants to know his product's potential for profit. How much does that sell for? Their back baller is £54 retail. £54 retail, what does it cost you to make? It's costing us £9 landed. So what is your profitability, gross and net profit? Yeah, generally the net is um, about 56%. The net? Yeah. The net profit? Yeah. OK, and what's your gross profit? Gross profit, 8 to 12%. You mean your net profit is 8 to 12 percent? Sorry. Right, OK. Sorry, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what's that in physical numbers rather than percentages? In last year, 700,000. Um, the... The... Um, net profit? The net profit on that was... 67,000. 67. So that's a little bit concerning because you have a good margin. So why is it that your net profit is so low? Uh, the cost of sale. So what else have you got in your cost of sales? Um, just the general expenses that go with running the business. Um, no, no, that's not your cost of sales. That's below the line. Oh, um, it... Um, Is it free shipping? Oh, sorry, and actually, the shipping, the shipping it's a is... shipping cost. Yeah, we it's cover free shipping. it. It is free right, shipping, This has yeah. turned into some kind shipping. of guessing game, which I personally don't find very helpful. Who runs your accounts for you? My accountant. Who runs your business for you? I run the business. Do I know all the account answers? No, I don't. I know if we're making money or not. Every detail of that you will catch me out. Deborah Meaden discovers that the entrepreneur is a little flaky when it comes to his figures. And it appears Tuka Suleiman is wondering if his recent sales surge could be just a flash in the pan. How does it feel to be in the right place at the right time? Yeah, yeah, it's good um, in terms of uh, COVID. Yeah, because I'm looking at your trend, 2016 and 2017, 450, 250, and then you've got the spike. Yeah. But where will it be when we get over COVID? Yeah. You're saying that it's worth £2 million when you made 60000 this year in a good year. Yeah. So have you pitched it at a valuation of being opportunistic? <laughs> Perhaps, but, uh, you know, on the flip side of that, we're also in an advanced talk to QVC in America. They're looking to launch early in the new year as well. Look, you've done a great job. Yeah. But I think you are very ambitious with your valuation. So on this journey, I'm going to let you go alone. I'm out. Noel's £2 million valuation is too much for Tuka Suleiman, and he makes an early exit from the discussion. And it appears Deborah Meaden has also made up her mind. You and I would drive each other absolutely bananas. You seem a great guy and a very smart guy, but I just don't think we would fit. So I'm afraid I won't be investing. I'm out. No, I think that you've invented something that is great. 
and I think that you'll probably be able to sell this because it clearly does what it says on the tin. But the margins at the moment are too small unless you have a massive win in the States, which you might get. Yeah. But it's just not something for me today. So I'm going to say, sadly, that I'm out. No. Yeah. We gave you a bit of a hard time on the numbers. And I hope that's a lesson, at least. You've done very well so far. You've come up with some great products that are unique. But based on looking at the numbers and taking into account the valuation, I don't think it's, a, it's an investment opportunity. So, look, good luck with it, but I'm out. Tej Lalvani becomes the fourth dragon out. Only Sarah Davies remains, and she's wondering if Noel's disclosure about that potential deal with a shopping channel could unlock this business's fortunes. Right. How long have you been talking to QVC? Just uh, re very recently. Because I can tell you I'm very, very good friends with the fitness buyer within that group. Oh, okay. And um, their fitness sales are through the roof. They cannot keep up with supply for fitness yeah. items. Your biggest potential here is the US market. But your business has been on a downward trajectory for the last few years. Mm -hmm. It's had a bit of a lift because of COVID. Nice that you think it's worth two million. Maybe with a dragon on board, it might be worth two million. But without a dragon on board, it's worth to 50, 300,000. But I am going to make you an offer. Ah! But based on my valuation of your business, that means for all of the money, yeah. I would want 35% of the business. Finally, an offer on the table. 35, ah. Oh. But demanding seven times more than the 5% Noel is offering. Will he be willing to accept it? Yeah, unfortunately, the top line figure I've coming in here is, and I'll be straight, and, and this is it, it's, it's 10%. I would love to work with you because of that TV shopping experience, but if we can work at 10%, we, we can do a deal. 10% is a, a bit low for me. Um, I would be prepared to say 25%, and I would drop to 20 when I got my 100,000 back. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think that makes it a whole lot sweeter. You know, that's, that's like having your bread jammed on both sides. My top number is 10, and, and that's not giving you your money back. You know, if you want your money back, that, you know, you, you can't have it both ways, Sarah, honestly. I, I can't have it both ways, but I've got a portfolio of businesses making me a lot of money. You've got this one, and I'm offering you the opportunity to turn the fortunes of that business around with my help and support, because you need a lot of it. OK, Sarah, give me the 12 months to give your money back, and we'll, we'll settle at the 10%. Go on. Well, well done. Boom. Oh, Excellent. wow, well, well done. done. Thank, well, you, well done. Thank you, Sarah. Well Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Can't Bye. wait to work with you. Sarah Davies agrees to Noel's tough terms and bags a deal. The hard negotiating entrepreneur leaves the den with the £100,000 he was seeking and a delighted dragon on board. I think uh, relief is definitely the word because I went through the mill there on the figures and um, ultimately came out with a deal. So, um, uh, yeah, just chuffed, chuffed. I tell you what, when it comes to negotiation, never, ever, ever underestimate an Irishman. Oh. He was <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> but I thought you were great too. I know I'll get my money back on the first order to the TV shopping channel yeah. in America. This could be a real key moment for this business to have Sarah Davis on board now. 
we're gonna do some good stuff, I just know we are. The next entrepreneur into the den is Angela Sterling from County Durham, who traded teaching for business after a flash of inspiration. I pretty much came up with the idea and started doing it. <laughs> I'd been a teacher for a lot of years, so it was just a case of taking that teaching expertise and bringing it down for younger children. Oh, the truck is going to be on fire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In business, I like to be really honest, ethical, upfront. You know, just like my personality, I wear my heart on my sleeve. <laughs> Big smiles, getting ready. Buenos dias, me presento. Buenos dias, sola. I'm in. <laughs> well. <laughs> Hello, Dragons. I'm delighted to be here today. My name's Angela Sterling, and I'm here to pitch for £50,000 in return for 10% of my business, Lingo Talk Language Classes for Children. Um, the UK needs great linguists for businesses to thrive in the global economy. And research tells us that the very best time to learn a language is before adolescence. And in 2014, languages became compulsory in primary schools in England. And that's where Lingo Talk comes in. Um, we teach French, Spanish, German, Mandarin and Arabic to children aged from birth to 11 through a network of 30 franchisees. And we teach around about 10,000 children every week. Last year, um, I turned over £188,000, making a net profit of £88,000. So, Dragons, hopefully with your help, we can get more children in the UK and across the world speaking in different languages. Alors, vous avez des questions? boys and girls. It's about half five. It's a très bien pitch from Angela Sterling from County Durham, who's asking for £50,000 in return for 10% of her franchise-based multi-language classes for kids. OK, boys and girls, au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Cheers. <laughs> That's what I get. Sarah Willingham, who has a lucrative track record in rolling out global franchises, is first with the questions. Will she find a common language with the linguistic entrepreneur? I haven't quite got my head around it. Just explain a little bit more to me as a customer Absolutely. what my experience would be. Well, I kind of have two, two different levels of, of speaking to you as a customer. The first would be as a mum. Yeah. So imagine you go along to um, all kinds of preschool classes with your children. So that might be messy play, it might be a little bit of singing, um, it might be drama. We do exactly that, but in the foreign language. But then we have a second tier where we work with nurseries and schools, and schools particularly. So we go into the school, we come in with all of the lessons, the resources, and we crucially provide the language as teacher. OK, so up until the age of five, you are delivering it direct to the child. Yes. And past the age of five, you're going into schools. Yes. Angela. Yes. Hi. Hello, Peter. Um, I immediately have a, quite a few concerns. You're making some very bold statements. Your current network are teaching 10,000 kids per week. Yes. So last week you taught 10,000 children. What did you generate in income? Um, I... I bill the franchises their 10% fee at the end of every academic term. I don't do it monthly or weekly. Um, so generally speaking, um, they would turn over as a network around about half a million pounds a year. And you charge them what, 10%? Yeah. So you've charged them 50,000 for the year? Yeah. So in simple terms, £10,000 a week is being generated by your network. So about a pound per child average. Wow. I've never broken down the figures to that, that extent before. 
Despite Angela's Lingo Tots classes reaching 10,000 children a week, Peter Jones's forensic breakdown of her figures reveals that per child, there are only small profits to be made for a dragon investor. Can she persuade Deborah Meaden that investing in her business will be money well spent? What are you going to do with the money? What do you need the money for? Two things. One of them is really to get more bums on seats, to sell more franchises, grow the network as much as possible. Um, and, but mainly... I'm, I'm really, really nervous telling you this. I know immediately you're going to go... Oh. Just say it. <laughs> I've never actually thrown my glass of water over anybody yet. You could be the first. <laughs> We are seriously looking to export to Dubai, and I have very good reasons for it, I promise. OK, go on, then. But because go if on, I was in your away. shoes, I'd be saying, well, Angela, come on, you've only just got a tiny little bit of the UK. Why on earth would you be wanting to go to Dubai? Yes. So the answer is, I used to work there, I used to teach there. Most of the schools there are great big international private schools um, full of expat children. And the issue that they have is because they're in the Middle East, they, they need to teach at least four hours of Arabic to the children every week. But their Arabic teachers, they've been taught to teach in a very different way, very chalk and talk, and it alienates children. Their version of Ofsted are, are really looking for partners in the UK. They have a problem, I have the perfect solution. And if I don't move on it now, I'm gonna miss the boat. In an unanticipated twist, Angela has revealed audacious expansion plans. And now Tuka Suleiman is keen to find out how a dragon would fit into them. Angela, um, apart from money, mm -hmm. what do you want from a dragon? Support. <laughs> Support. Um, I really I feel myself getting emotional. Um, I'm a teacher. I've learned the business as I go along. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> hey, dear. How embarrassing. <laughs> um, and all of the business, I'm really proud of it, but I've had to learn it from scratch. And I feel at the moment, I feel constrained because I don't know the answers to the questions. I don't know the right people to ask the questions to, and most of the time I don't even know the question. Yeah, I'm dead sorry, I wasn't expecting this. It's all right. Um, it's really frustrating. Um, so, what I would love from a dragon is... It's just answers. You know, I want to do this, how do I do it? What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I ask? While an emotional Angela recovers her composure, her ambitious strategy for international growth is playing on Sarah Willingham's mind. Um, the challenge I, I'm really feeling sitting here thinking about it as an investment opportunity mm -hmm. is that I, I think it becomes really complicated when you start to go abroad. I understand why you've done the du Dubai thing, but you are limited to the international school market. You are very limited to the places where you have significant expats, you know, it's not enormous. Not franchising, though. Not franchising. Franchising will not work in Dubai. We're going to teach them how to deliver a lingo talk course. If I can share with you the projections for Dubai, that might help. Um, so, and I've had all of this checked by specialists as well, and they actually think I'm under-egging things. Um, but I'm looking at this year would be turning over £750,000 with a net profit of 500 Year two, 1.3 with a net profit of 1 million. And then 2 million with a net profit of 1.5 million. And that's simply because over in Dubai, we would be going out as almost consultants. We'd be upskilling their teachers. We'd go out, we'd train them. Um, we'd provide them with all the materials and support, but... Angela. I mean, Angela, it's just mad. It's just not mad. It's it absolutely mad. Do you know what? You need to put maths into this. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've had all the figures checked. Angela, I can tell you it's nonsense. It doesn't matter who you have checked over your numbers. You can't go from forecasting what you were forecasting and now thinking Dubai is going to produce that type of profit. 
in, in year one and then particularly a million pounds a year profit in, that, in year that two. That first year profit is five schools. It's, it's just not possible. I've got appointments with people who You can have as many 60, appointments as you like, schools. but it's not going to be possible to produce that. With the experience that you have and yeah. the knowledge that you currently have, to go from zero to hero in that one quick step thinking that Dubai uh, is going to be your lucky ticket is where the naivety kicks in in your business model. I've been in education since 2005. I know it quite well and it's a tough market. It is. If I ran it as a business, today I would lose money. And I don't think I'm bad at running businesses. So I say good luck to you, keep going. There's nothing wrong with having drive and enthusiasm mm -hmm. and a vision. Mm -hmm. I would just say stay, stay at the level of which you are at today to grow it organically. Don't scale this to the levels that you want to because you'll run out of cash. But it's not a business for me to invest in and I'm out. Peter Jones doesn't share Angela's optimistic expectations of her venture into the Middle East. Is internet mogul Nick Jenkins also concerned that she's biting off more than she can chew? I think those numbers are just entirely unrealistic in the context of how business works. Whenever you're going into business, think about it from both sides and ask yourself, does this make sense? Always put yourself in the buyer's seat. No, we haven't. The, 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 the uh, no, figures... Okay, that's oh, just no, that's, that didn't require an answer. That was just a piece of advice. I hope that you will make a good success of what you've done. Thank you. But I'm out. Thank you. Angela. Yeah. When you look at a franchise business, you have to look at the underlying ongoing revenue, not the franchise fee revenue, because at some Absolutely. point... Absolutely. ..the franchise fee revenue is going to stop. And if you think of 30 franchisees at the moment, you're making 40 or 50 grand. Mm -hmm. So let's say we get to 200. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a 300 grand But we're revenue. not, because a lot of the recently signed up franchisees, they haven't had their chance to start making their money yet. OK, let's double it. Mm -hmm. It's still 600,000. There's still a, a really obvious ceiling on where the business can get to. So, all the best, but I'm out. The Den's franchising queen declined the deal. Will global manufacturing tycoon Tuka Suleiman be any more willing to invest in the determined entrepreneur? What you need is to bring on a partner. Do you think? Locally, that's very close to you. My husband is really keen um, to, to come on board. He, um, he's got a lot of business experience. That's, that's what you need. But it's getting the business to a level where we can afford to bring him in. <laughs> From what you're saying, there's, there's a lot of profit coming through which will afford your husband. Yeah, true. My advice is take it slowly, calculate it, don't stretch yourself too much where you jeopardise what you've got. Mm -hmm. So, you probably know what's coming. This is not for me. Yeah. Um, and I, I've told you what you need. And for that reason, Angela, I'm out. Whew. Encouraging words for the passionate entrepreneur, but Angela gets none of Tuka Suleiman's cash. Only Deborah Meaden remains. Will she be a financial shoulder to cry on? I'm going to tell you where I am. You did very well. Not let it know when you got upset, <laughs> you know. But you got upset at the moment when you were talking about support, and that's yeah. because you feel lonely. And let them do it again. That's because you feel lonely. Mm. I, I'll bet you every single person in this chair has had those moments of yeah. total loneliness. When you're in business with somebody, you do sometimes need to spend time together. When you feel like, I want to sit down for a cup of tea, I just want to yeah. work this out. I don't think we're going to be able to spend an awful lot of time together. I've got a lot of other businesses. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, if, I, if it had been natural for me, you know, if it had been a natural area, I think that we could probably have overcome that. But I can't find anything that is making me feel I could, I could deliver for you, to be perfectly honest. So I wish you all the best of luck, but I'm afraid I won't be investing. I'm out. Thank you. Good luck. Well Thank you. Bye-bye.
As she bids the dragons farewell, Angela leaves the den without an investment, but with plenty of homework to be getting on with. Done well to take it to this level. She'll get to 70, 90, 100 franchisees even, where she will be able to manage it. She should focus here in the UK, keep going, and when she thinks of Dubai, consider it a holiday, not a business. <laughs> I'm embarrassed at how emotional I got. <laughs> it just came out of nowhere, and look, I'm still doing it. I think it's just because it's so close to my heart. The idea they had of searching for a business partner was a really, really good one. So I'm just going to sit down with a cuppa, blank bit of paper and a pencil and plan it all out. Ryan's confident that next Christmas will be very busy indeed. I think this is the moneymaker. This has been the best product I've come up with yet in my life, and that's why I think that I'll be able to capture some investment. Easy tree stand. I can't tell you how many easy tree stands I've got at home. Well, I've got a couple. Not one of them's easy. They're not that easy, are they? No. <laughs> I think if the dragons feel the Christmas spirit, that will definitely help, because uh, really, who doesn't love Christmas? Oh, my goodness. It looks like Father Christmas. <laughs> wow. Hello, dragons, and Merry Christmas. My name is Ryan Walk. I've come all the way from Los Angeles. I am the inventor of the Easy Treesy Christmas Tree Stand, and I am here today to offer you the opportunity to purchase 5% of my company in exchange for a 50,000 pound investment. Now, who loves Christmas? Hey. Terrific, yes. me too, it's my favorite holiday. Who loves setting up a Christmas tree in a Christmas tree stand? Really? All right, well, good for you. You're gonna love it even more. Because what if it was just this easy? If you could just take your Christmas tree, lift it up, rest it on the stand, make sure it's straight. Cool. And that's it. It's not straight. Oh, oh, oh. Well, then I didn't make sure it was straight. Do right? you want to take it out and make sure it's straight? I, I can do that. Is that part of the point? Yes, of course, right. So, push down on a couple of jaws. This is a rather heavy tree. Want some help? Yeah, I would love some help. <laughs> All right, let's go. It's hard to push down and pull okay. up when it's up. So right, tell me what should, I should do. Would you rather pull the tree up or push down on the jaws? I mean, I'll, I'll push the tree up. Okay, great. I'm not going to get down okay. there. Are you ready? Pull it, yep. Oh, there you go. I've got the tree. Like I'm wearing a thousand pound suit. Are you insured? No, well, the, you're going to get sap on it. <laughs> get on there now. Okay. Push it further up towards me a little bit. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. There. Straight down. Hey. Oh, whoa! Oh. Still not quite straight. Still not straight. Pull it forward a bit. It the have to the do. stand will hold it however you put it in. Right. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> uh. Does that look better? So the Easy Treasy is the world's first drop in Christmas tree stand. One person, as you saw, can install a tree in seconds. Uh, thank you, and I welcome your questions. Ryan Wok is asking for £50,000 for a 5% equity stake in his Christmas tree stand business. Oh, God, you have oh my God. covered in it. Yeah. Come on, Billy. <laughs> Rescue me. Yeah, it's covered in it. Though he may have to spend the first £1,000 of it replacing Tuka Suleiman's suit. Ryan, you're saved here. Oh, good. Anglo-US diplomatic crisis averted. It's time for business. But worryingly, Peter Jones thinks the American may have entered the den under an assumed identity. Ryan, I couldn't help notice then that you went, oh, oh, oh. It's not straight. Oh, oh, oh. Well, then I didn't make sure it was straight. I just wondered whether you've painted your beard black. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you meant to say, oh, ho, 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 ho. No, no, yeah, no, this is natural. Can we hear a ho ho from you? You have got a good ho ho ho. Oh, that's well really, done. That's really <laughs> that's good. Perfect. So, Ron, you've come a long way. I have from Los Angeles to here. What's your job? Um, I am employed by the Walt Disney Company. Are you? Yeah. Wow. At Disney, what do you do? I'm I'm an Imagineer. No, I, I want I, to be an Imagineer. I, that sounds brilliant. Yeah. What does Imagineer do? Um, Imagineering. We're responsible for all new attractions around the world. I want to be an Imagineer. Christmas is beautiful, it's an amazing time, and we all know that, but over the years, this problem has been an issue. But more recently, I managed to find a product. It's like your product there, 
The only difference is that you have a screw. Sure. I think there might even be three or four. Generally, actually. there's three or four, yeah. Yeah. The difference there is, though, you get away with a little bit of repositioning because you, sure. you can unscrew slightly one side. Does there's, yours have that capability? You, you can do that. It's, if you release uh, any of the tension on the jaws, just like you would to, to lift it out. OK, yeah. That's so much better. That's yes. much better. <laughs> Why didn't you do that in the first place? I think I got hung up on the fact you were, that it's you were, drop in and done. You were faffing around then. <laughs> it was, it was that would have been a lot. Of, that's really good. So how many are you projecting you'll sell in your first year? First year, I'm, I'm projecting 10,000 units. And so what's that based on? An average of 90, 90 million Christ, real Christmas trees are sold each year. Between the US, Canada, and Europe, my assumptions are that one in 10 people buy a Christmas tree stand a year. That's 9 million tree stands. If eventually I can capture 10% of the market, which Deborah, it looks like you disagree with. <laughs> the amount of people who come in here saying, if only I could capture 10% of the market. But that's still 900,000 stands a year. Cut it in half, that's 450,000 stands a year. Well, if you <laughs> sell it, yeah, if you sell yes, them. Yes, quite. <laughs> right, OK. When you say my assumption is, have you been to a retailer of Christmas trees in the US and said, how often do you sell a Christmas tree stand alongside the tree? Uh, no, I haven't. That could have been quite a smart thing to do. Yeah. I like what you've done here. Thank you. Uh, and clearly it sounds like it's much better than what the competition has to offer. But I have a concern about the seasonality of the product. Yes. If you're going to sell 10,000 units, that's pretty much 10,000 units over three months. But then for the rest of the nine months, you've got no cash flow coming in. How, how does that work as a business? It, really what I want to do is establish more of a brand rather than a single product. So going forward is really a, a full line of all things Christmas decorating, um, all sorts of other Ryan. ancillary products that can, just Ryan, all easy trees. I was hoping that you were going to say, I have another product that will fill the gap for the other nine months. Oh, I understand. But no. now you, you've dug your gravy even bigger now. Make it even more seasonal. A business based around sales in just the winter months leaves to Kasuliman cold. And Jenny Campbell still wants to get to the root of Ryan's finances. Can he beat the banker this time? How much have you spent yourself on bringing this to market? Uh, 60,000. And now you're ready to go to market? Well, no. As soon as the, the tooling is complete, then yes. And what needs to happen for the tooling to be complete? This so is what the investment's it, for? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> It's been, it's been a bit of a saga. It was actually last August that I kicked off tooling with a local manufacturer. So I was, I was told it would be a six to eight week lead time. Turned into, it's been, uh, what, nine, 10 months now and they're not done. Yay, yay, yay. So what have you got for your $60,000? Do you have tooling? Well, I'm in the process of getting it back. <laughs> um, so you the, haven't got tooling and no, you're trying to recover your money. So that was a disaster. Uh, yeah. I think you need to hear that voice in your head, Ryan, that says stop. Stop with that manufacturer. I heard that voice. They it, promised it took it, a little too long. They promised but, it in six weeks. They promised yeah. it for last Christmas. They promised it before you came on the den. Oops, oops, yeah. oops. Oh, absolutely. I just think the whole timing of this being here is wrong for you at the moment because you're just way off being able to say, here's the bones of a business, please invest with me. Way off it. So, all the best. Merry Christmas. I'm out. A festive but forthright farewell from Jenny Campbell and a first loss for the creative Californian. And now Tuka Suleiman has more bad tidings to deliver. I think you're a very likeable guy. Thank you. But I don't think you're a good businessman, Ryan. Oh, ouch. If I'm going to invest in somebody, mm -hmm. I've got to really trust what they're doing is right. And, and I would question your business acumen. Ouch. I'm not going to invest in them out. I don't agree with Tuka, actually. Um, I, th I think you are quite astute. And your product does work. Um, it's then looking at what is the potential stumbling block here. Um, and I think valuing a business at this stage at a million pounds. I don't want to own 50, 60% of your company even if I was really interested. And that's sadly why I'm going to say that I'm out. As an Imagineer, you're, you're amazing. I mean, you imagine something quite brilliant, which is really good. But that aside, 
The seasonality aspect does bother me. I generally don't invest in businesses with very high seasonality. Yeah, yeah. So I wish you all the best, but for me, it's not the right investment, so I'm going to say I'm out. An avalanche of exits and the tree stand inventor now teeters on the precipice of failure. Only one dragon remains. Can Deborah Meaden see a future in this Christmas business? It looks to me like it's a cool solution. Yeah. And actually, seasonality doesn't worry me. And the reason seasonality doesn't worry me at all is I spent my life in a seasonal business. We made all of our profit in one month of the year. The trouble is, you've still got a tool that doesn't work yet. And whilst you can always solve those problems, it's very expensive to solve those problems. Right. But because it's just not there, I won't be investing. I'm out. Thanks. How about a yo a yo from you? Ho, ho, ho. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. A schooling in tooling as Ryan loses his final dragon. The spectacularly bearded American leaves the den with plenty of goodwill, but no cash. It's made me all Christmassy now. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I actually want to I actually want to decorate that tree. Can you reach up and, and put a star on top there? You're tall enough for that. Well, I, I could lift somebody I know up there. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was asking the den if my beard was dyed and I'm actually Father Christmas. Well, I can definitely tell you I'm not really Father Christmas. Next tonight is London-based Zara Salim. She's hoping to capitalise on a family secret that's been passed down through the generations. My grandmother and my mother, they created recipes of their own, so it's very much been a part of my life, growing up with skincare and using my own remedies. But it's not just wisdom gleaned from her elders, which Zara hopes could stand her in good stead in the den. I used to be a primary school teacher, so my audience is usually small children. So I'm hoping that um, that helps me in some way. Hi, Dragons. My name is Zara, and I'm here today to ask for a £50,000 investment in return for a 15% stake in my business, Delicious. Delicious is an all-natural, vegan, cruelty-free, Ayurvedic-inspired skincare brand. Originally from India, Ayurveda is one of the most oldest healing systems in the world. And it was around three and a half years ago when I was pregnant with my second daughter that I developed a really terrible dry skin condition. Not wanting to use any creams that had any chemicals in them, I decided to use my knowledge on Ayurveda, which had been passed down to me from my grandmother and my mother, to develop my own skincare recipe. And it was here that I discovered one miracle ingredient, which is Indian black assam tea. My skin transformed within a week, and I knew that I had found my hero product. So I decided to launch the brand while still on maternity leave from my job as a primary school teacher with a newborn and a toddler in tow. And within six months, the brand was featured in a lot of press. And I also landed a deal with the Hut Group and supplied Glossy Box with 100,000 units of my body scrub. This then enabled me to expand the range to three different body scrubs. They're 100% natural, vegan and plastic free too. I would like to use the investment to expand my range and include facial products, and I would love to have a dragon on board to help me scale my brand. Delicious is more than just a skincare brand. It is about diversity and representation, which the skincare market desperately needs to see more of. And growing up, I would have loved to have seen a brand like Delicious on the shelves. Thank you. A black tea-based, Indian-influenced body care range is the proposition from Zara Salim, who's looking for £50,000 in return for a 15% share in her company. Deborah Meaden is keen to try and get under the skin of the vegan-friendly business. First of all, Ayurvedic. Yes. What's what's the what's behind that? Absolutely. So um, Ayurveda, like I said, it's a very it? old Ayur Ayurveda. 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 It's a system of medicine. It's, it's an alternative therapy. Okay. So Ayurveda kind of spans across not just skincare and hair care, but it's diet, it's exercise, it's a way of holistically managing your health, but through the use of natural ingredients. Okay, great, thank you. So now, now I understand why that underpins what you're currently yeah. doing. So in terms of the ingredients of this, which have a lovely smell about them, these are all clean ingredients? Yes, they no are. No parabens, no sulfates. Yes, absolutely. Um, no nasties. No. 
OK, so do these see top to toe? But they are body, they're body... I don't yeah. know why I thought they were supposed... They were skin. Yep, you can. You can use them yeah. on your face. You can use them... Just, it literally is top to toe, because it is 100% natural. And yeah. who's making it? I am. <laughs> I hand make all the products. It's like literally like a kitchen brand. However, we have now outsourced this month to a manufacturer. But that, that, that you currently, made. That is handmade, yes. I shall treasure that as a handmade product. Oh, I'm so pleased. <laughs> Zara appears to have thought of everything as she woos an environmentally aware Deborah Meaden. But perhaps the inclusion of an instruction manual would have helped her struggling Peter Jones. I'm trying to work it out because I'm looking for the press, the turn... How do you get that out? Yeah, so you do have to press quite firmly. Where? Um, the bottom is the base, it's a push-up disc. Wow. Yeah, and then you just kind of glide on. You do have to be quite gentle because if you push out too much, um, you have to kind of get something else to push it back in. I've, I've just done that. Look what's happened. Yeah. Uh oh Yeah. Ooh. Not being rude, I wonder if that is a design fault, that... Because, hmm. I mean, I've been pressing this and I'm quite strong. I can't even... Well, I can now, and it's starting to break. And then when it comes up, it goes up too far and then you can't push it back down. Yeah, I have... I mean, I haven't had any customers have problems with the packaging. So, because it's such a new concept, I, I do want to fine-tune it and I do want to make it better. I do think that needs a bit of work. Yeah. It, well, it definitely does need a bit yeah, of work. Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. The push-up packaging of Zara's body balm gives Peter Jones a problem to ponder. Will Stephen Bartlett be able to help get the entrepreneur's ailing pitch back on track with some probing questions about the background of the beauty brand? When did you start the business? What year? So, it was 2018. Um, can you give me an idea of how your business has progressed in terms of sales? Yep, sure. So, um, year one, we turned over 64,000. Year two, which was COVID year, the turnover kind of dropped, so it was a turnover of 25,000. However, this year, in the first five months, I've already turned over 45,000, and I'm on track to end the year on 150,000, with a gross of 100 and a net of 66. I, I'm more concerned about the fact that, during the lockdown, your sales completely plummeted because that's highly unusual, especially in beauty. That, in my mind, has to be a reflection of the product. I think it was... It was probably me to blame as well, in the sense that I am very much like a one-man band. And the COVID year, I had my kids at home, and I think I took that time to kind of step back. Did you, did you have another job, or did you...? No, I didn't. And, and did you pay yourself, or have you paid I yourself? Don't, I don't. I don't pay myself. I don't take a salary. So, and of those, five, in the last five months, you said you've done about 40, 50,000? 45,000. Sure. Turning. Give me an idea of where those sales have happened in terms of channels. Yeah, sure. So, um, I would say a large proportion of those sales has been from my social media. I've seen, like, a massive growth. So, um, I organically grew my TikTok platform from zero followers in January to about 40,000. And I had a few of my videos go viral, so I had a couple of videos with, like, a million views. But it hasn't... But it's not generating the sales, though, is it? So this year, it has really massively helped, and I truly believe if I was to continue with the marketing strategy that I am, and I would love to have some help on that, because I've not spent a single penny on advertising or marketing. But if you've got a million or millions of views already, and that hasn't resulted in hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of sales... Yeah. It might be the fact that the video's really good, but they don't want the product. I disagree. I think that... But why didn't that result in sales? Um, I think it did, because I started on, like, 2,000, 3,000 pounds, a month from like January, and then it started to double, double. Last month was £20,000 in sales. And I feel like it's growing because people are finally seeing the product and seeing the results that customers have. It is honestly insane. I cannot even believe the results that people are having. It's, it's quite life-changing for a lot of people. Zara defends her product against aspersions that a sluggish eyeballs-to-earnings conversion rate is contrary to kindred competitors' trends. Tuka Suleiman has been listening to proceedings quietly. Has he been able to make up his mind as to whether this is a venture worthy of his investment? You're great. Thank you. Enthusiastic. And, and I'm just wondering whether it's bad luck. You know, yeah. I, I'd like to just hear what Sarah's got to say, being um, you know, a woman in, in, who 
with being a woman. <laughs> I wondered where he was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where you him. <laughs> now, I respect your judgment, but I'd love to hear more about the product from you. Um, f from what I can ascertain sitting here, it seems great. I honestly thought, when well, you said skincare, I was like, wow, you've got great skin. <laughs> it must be amazing. <laughs> but then you said you don't do any facial products. Yeah, no, I don't do any facial products, but you can use a body scrub on your face and I've got some really good ideas for new products as well. So I feel like I'm on the cusp of something. Yeah, I, and I, I can hear that, and your, yeah. your passion and enthusiasm for it is brilliant. But what difference do you think I'm going to make as a dragon coming on board? I just feel like you would have the connections and the yeah. support network, and do you know what, uh, marketing strategy. We can absolutely put products on shelves. What we can't do is stuff. take them back off the shelves. Yeah. You've got to have the sell through yes. to make the product a success. And my worry is that you've had a window on these. You've had great media exposure. It hasn't correlated into sales. You know, they always say business is about hard work, grit, determination, drive, and you just need that bit of luck. And I feel like you've had the bit of luck and that didn't convert. And I'm not sure we're lucky enough to get a second time round at it. So I wish you all the best in the business, but I don't feel like I can invest today. I'm out. A setback for the body care entrepreneur, as Sarah Davies fears that her customer base, as well as her good fortune, could prove finite. Deborah Meaden may have been made up with handmade, but does she believe Zara's products have what it takes to stand out in a crowded market? I cannot tell you how many boxes of samples I receive a week. This is a busy, busy place, and this is why trying to get yourself to the head of that race is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I have a bad feeling that if I put that against all the other boxes that I get, I'm not sure I would pick it out. Sadly, I have a feeling that's what's happening to you online. So I wish you all the best, but I'm out. Thank you. And Zara, I, I used the product on both my hands. I was surprised that one side of my hand, to compare to the other, it literally stripped it clean, mm -hmm. and it was brilliant. Um, I loved everything you said as the voiceover, everything that you stood for and the rationale um, and your why. I just think that the product itself does need a, a little bit more work done on it mm -hmm. to make it absolutely what you want it to become. And then perhaps you might get more customers thinking this is exactly the product and then you mix your message to a great product and then I think you will have success. Yeah. But at the moment, I think it's a bit early for that. So that's the reason, sadly, I'm going to say that I'm out. OK, thank but you. But good luck. Two more turndowns for Zara. But could a zoned-in on the zeitgeist Stephen Bartlett be about to adopt a more supportive stance? I just wanted to um, endorse a couple of things you'd said. So the first is the... Ayurvedic trend, which is a massive trend on social media at the moment. And the product, I actually really like the product as well. I think it smells great. I think this is interesting. And that actually makes it more compelling as a story. So I think you've done a lot of things right. Yes. The thing that I've struggled with is every time I look down at my book and it shows that dip in sales between years one and two, I don't know how that's possible even considering the COVID circumstances because the unpredicted chaos of COVID perfectly represents the journey of an entrepreneur. Things happen and it's absolute hell at times. Yeah. And as an entrepreneur, your outcome, success or failure, is often determined by how you adapt. And what I can yeah. see in that year is that we weren't able to adapt when unexpected chaos showed up. Yeah. That for me is concerning. And I can't get over that. So unfortunately, I'm out. Zara, um, I think you're great. Thank you. However, as a business, I think maybe you need to go back and just have a re-look at this. Yeah. Because somewhere, it's a barrier. So it's not investable. 
And for that reason, I'm out. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Good Thank luck, you. Sarah. Good luck, Sarah. Thank you. Unfortunately for Zara, she must leave the den with nothing. Her tea-based body care range may have failed to bag the backing of a dragon, but the entrepreneur remains confident that her products can cause a stir. I still believe that the brand has a lot of potential. I'm going to continue to grow the business, expand the range, and hopefully see some more success out of it. Hoping her baby-based business is robust enough to survive the Dragon's Road test is tonight's next entrepreneur, Sophie Hepworth. I'm not a product designer who's creating products based on margins. I'm creating products that mums like me really, really want. Hi, Dragons. My name is Sophie Hepworth, founder of By Sophie and inventor of the multi-award winning Little Hopper. I'm here today to pitch for £75,000 in exchange for a 5% share in both Little Hopper and the wider Buy Sophie business. Little Hopper is the world's first alternative to plastic three-in-one baby system that offers parents looking for eco-friendly and super stylish baby products an unrivaled shelf life from naught to four years old. Its transformational design allows it to adapt from a baby gym to a baby bouncer and finally a children's activity table. After almost two years, we finally managed to bring our product to market in January of this year. Since then, we have secured nine retail stockists and we have sold our product into 26 countries across the globe. I welcome the Dragons to come and take a closer look and open up to questions. We've got a nominated dragon that always comes up and tries baby products, and that's uh, Tuka. Try not to break it, Tuka. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. OK. Try, I'll try. A planet-friendly, multifunctional system for babies is the product on offer from Sophie Hepworth. Amazing quality. Thank you. She's asking for a £75,000 investment for a 5% slice of her company. And it's really strong. It's very strong, so it will take up to a two-year-old. It's great. Peter Jones is the first to jump in on the hopper. Now I've had my dragon baby testers do their work, <laughs> we can talk to you about the product. Yes. Tell me about the journey. When did you start? When I became a mum for the first time about four years ago, I was sat in my lounge and I looked around and everywhere that I could see there was baby tat and it did not look like my house anymore. And I searched and spent many a late night feed looking for initially a wooden baby bouncer. It just didn't exist. There was nothing out there in this space alternative to plastic. So that was, I guess, where the business started. But at the time, the idea of Little Hopper, which I'd sketched out and is pretty much what you see here today, it just seemed too big to tackle. So I sat on it for a while. So that was back in 2016. So um, in 2018... Yes, I don't want to actually live the five years with you. OK. Sorry to be quite blunt, I've got limited time, so I want to get the answers to my questions. That's OK. So in 2018, I made the decision, crazily, to sell my house, to fund the first order of this and to invest in the tooling and the testing and everything else. You sold your house? I did. Wow. I didn't want to ask anyone for it. OK. I believed that I could do this no, great. and that it would make me money. What's been the total sales since you launched? So we've just had six months of trading. Perfect. And um, Little Hopper is 136,000. Yeah. Gross profit? 66. And net? We're on a minus 84 at the moment. 84? Yes. Thank you. Sophie? Yes. I totally get it. I've Thank been you. there, sat in the living room, looked at the big plastic pile of rubbish. If only you'd had this out seven years ago. Yeah. I would heard totally that a lot. have bought one. Thank Absolutely. You. So, um, what does it retail for? The three in one is three nine nine, mm -hmm. and the baby bouncer we sell on its own at two nine nine. Wow! So, I mean, it's lovely, but it really is at the luxury end. Premium. 
But I think the thing that's really important to mention is our baby bouncer has a shelf life of two years. It's really robust and it takes a two year old. The products that are on the market, they last three to four months on average. The price of our product, I would argue, is cheaper than the plastic alternative. Well, price that's per interesting use. you say that. My baby bouncer that I bought seven years ago, yeah. it's 60 pounds. That's been recycled through three kids and is still going. So we've had a good six years of heavy use yeah. out of ours at 60 pounds. So I do think you're at the very high end luxury, not the mass market end of the market. A stumbling block for Sophie as Pennywise parent Sarah Davies questions the price point of her product. Can the entrepreneur bounce back into favour with the king of the kindergarten, Tuka Suleiman? Well done. Thank I mean, you. I, I can see there's a lot of attention gone to that. Thank you. And a lot of yeah. sweat and tears. Yeah, absolutely. But you've lost 80,000 in six months. Only because of the setup costs for the tooling, photography, videography, websites. Can I just check, do you have any assets at all on your balance sheet? Any tooling or any? Um, yeah, just the, the tools. So how much was in the tooling? I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I do need to understand the mechanics of the business. A gross profit of 66,000 and a loss of £84,000. Yes. Now, between your gross profit and your loss, you've spent £150,000. Mm -hmm. What on? OK. So, um, we've spent £39,000 on product design. That's good, that's valid. Yeah, we've spent... I think it's about £35,000 on marketing. Um, salaries, I'm paying myself £12,500. Um, website, that was around about £10,000. Anything IP related, so we've had quite a lot of legal costs. How much? Uh, about £4,000. OK, at the moment you've identified 100 out of 150. There's something quite substantial that you've spent your money on. I'm sorry, I just, I can't think what, what is on my balance sheet. I'm so sorry. Transport costs? Uh, t all right, Tuka, you tell me then. Can I just ask a question, Deborah? I'm trying to help. I am asking an entrepreneur the the what their business itself. does. I think she's in a very in difficult year. position, Deborah, and, and she's very nervous, and I'm just trying to help. And like I've just said, is transport costs within that you might have forgotten about? It's, it's possible. Sophie, I do think from a financial perspective, you really have to understand where you're spending money, what your balance sheet looks like, or if you can't do it, and that's OK, have an advocate side by side that's going to give confidence to an investor that if they're going to hand over cash to you, we're not going to have a conversations to say, Sophie, where did that 50 grand go? And you go, do you know what? I'm so sorry, I don't know. And that's just not good enough. So, sadly, I'm out. Numbers proved to be far from child's play for the baby product designer, prompting Peter Jones to become the first dragon to bail on the business. But it appears both the entrepreneur and her offering have impressed the dragon to his right. I love the product, and you as an entrepreneur, I feel like we'd get on really, really well. How'd you get to this valuation? 1.5 million? We have a product here that is world-class. It is award-winning. The investment is not just in this product, it's in me and the team of people that have created this. And this is the first thing we've done. And we have more products already waiting to go. You have this special bit, which is that creative genius to create beautiful products that people love. However, I, I've sat here trying to figure out how this becomes that eight, nine figure, really exciting global brand. And it's just not there. So for that reason, I'm out. Stephen Bartlett can't foresee Sophie's baby business booming and bows out. And it appears Sarah Davies hasn't bounced back from her earlier concerns that the entrepreneur's product is simply too pricey.
My assessment of the situation yes. is that you've designed a product which I would love to go and buy if I was back at that stage in my life, but I'm in the privileged position where I can afford to justify that spend. The majority of parents probably couldn't, which worries me in terms of the mass marketability. And it's for that reason that I wouldn't want to invest. So I'm out. Sophie, you have invented something lovely, but I'm afraid the commercial side of it, mm -hmm. you haven't really got across. The issue with that is that that makes it really hard for me as an investor. And when I'm asking you the questions and not Tuka, it's because I want to know what you understand about your business. So I'm afraid I can't invest, I'm out. Failing to nail her numbers has proven costly for Sophie as Deborah Meaden departs, leaving just Tuka Suleiman as a potential investor. He was in her corner when she faced a tough financial interrogation. Is the baby product bigwig prepared to plug her in to his global operation? If you had to make a list of all the things that you need, tell me what they are. I need to have this product stocked in more places than the UK. To so distribution? Yeah. I probably need help just to make sure that we are getting the product at the best price and if there's anything further that we can do at, at that end, at Source in China, that would really help us. And you need help on running the business and you get on with creating the product for the brand. Yeah. Now, there is potential, but I'm going to want to be like equal sort of partner. What we'll be able to offer you is a team that can run the business for you on a day to day. We have a fantastic distributor in China. So I'm willing to offer you 100,000, not yep. 75. Okay. But I want 45% of the business. Would you consider coming down from the 45% if I'm able to get you your money back? That really defeats the whole object of having the incentive to make this happen. So I would stick to my offer, but I would give you access to my whole team where you can bounce off whatever you want. Um, on that basis, I would like to accept your offer. Great. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Okay. Sophie, well done. You've got Thank a great you. dragon. Thank you, guys. Sophie has done it. She may have given away almost half her company, but she leaves with considerably more cash than she was asking for, and a dragon with an ever-growing portfolio of baby businesses to really push her product. <laughs> I kind of thought it was all over, so it was a nice surprise. Tuka knows the baby industry, so I think it's going to be a bright future. <laughs> It just fits into my portfolio. You liked it, though, that was the thing. Yeah, somebody has to have the best, and that's the best. 